Okay, hello everyone, and I'm delighted to say we've got another guest on for the Coffee Microcaps Fund Manager interview series. Today, I'm going to be joined all the way from Auckland, New Zealand, uh, Chris Stepto from DMX Asset Management. Hi, Chris. Hey, Mac. Thanks for having me. Oh, great to have you on. Um, for people who are not familiar with um, DMX, uh, can you maybe give us a bit of an overview of, uh, of DMX Asset Management? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, DMX has been going since 2015. Um, we've uh, yeah, got 16 million funds under management. Um, and, you know, um, as the name suggests, we, we like to provide capital to, to growing ASX listed companies. Um, so often, you know, we'll become shareholders in a company via a replacement or, or an IPO. Um, I suppose secondly, you know, we're really focused on the um, sort of micro and, and even like what we like to call nano cap segment of the, of the market. So our median um, market cap in our portfolio is um, it's just 45 million. So we're, we're quite tiny. Um, and yeah, and we've also got, you know, 30 to 40 positions at, at a time. So we're quite diversified. Kind of given that the 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 risk at that that lower end of the market. Yeah, I think yeah, most kind of people's definition is fifty million for a nano cap. So yeah, you're you're firmly down that small and kind of like our very first guest on this uh, series. Um, we had David McNamee from Altor, and he's also very focused on that kind of sub fifty million uh, market cap market. Um, and just tell me, I I know you guys have had the uh, the DMX kind of company structure up and running for a couple of years now, but you're you're planning on uh, on uh, doing something new now in, in in the next month or two. Yeah, look, um, we've um, you know we've built a, a performance. Uh, we've been going for nearly six years, and we've been returning twenty two percent a year. Um, and we, and we've been building up our team as well. So um, you know we've had uh, Steve McCarthy and Roger Collison started uh, at the beginning. I've been in for four years, um, and um, Michael her dad's just joined. And yeah, we, we feel as if we're um, ready to uh, uh, got enough capability to start a new fund. Uh, so um, yeah, the, I, I guess you know that with a, a, a micro nano cap fund, um, you can only get so big. And um, we we want to keep that original DMX Capital Partners fund uh, small. So we're we're looking to close that um, in, in in a short while and um, yeah start a new fund. Um, the the uh, it'll it'll allow DMX to sort of say true to its word and and um, uh, we can um, yeah uh, and, and we'll we'll start off with um, at least fifty percent of the same companies, um, but we'll be looking to add. Um, some some larger companies. There'll still be you know micro caps, but uh, just um, not not the uh, illiquid ones that we, we'd struggle to get into anyway. Um, with yeah, so it's kind of more, kind of a, a bit of nano and the and the bigger end of micro. We can say or, the, or if you want to look at the other way, the, the small end of small caps maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And kickoff for that is it going to be? Oh uh, yeah, March, uh, March first is March first. Uh, we're we're taking um, uh, interest, so you can go onto our website and uh, register interest at the moment. And okay. uh, we, we should have our documents out in the next couple of weeks. Okay, great. And then uh, do you just want to confirm the website for people, just so they. So uh, they it's, yep, it's dmxam.com.au. Okay, great. Okay, well, let's get into uh, the two stocks you've decided to talk about today from the portfolio. Um, one I followed for many a year. Um, uh, the other one is, is actually quite new to me, and that's for somebody who looks at micro cap stocks a lot. Um, so I think it's going to be a good chat. So the first one um, is uh, CCOS, uh, SES. Um, so the just Basic, back to basics, how do these guys make money, Chris? Yeah. yeah. So what I first wanted to do was just put, put these companies in context within the, the whole portfolio. Okay. I'll just, just share my screen. Yeah, perfect. Go for it. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so we kind of um, think about the positions, it would put them into categories. So, um, you know, we've, we've kind of got uh, just under 40% of our, of our companies are, are kind of low PE multiples, like below the market average. Uh, they're profitable and growing and they're kind of like the store of the, the portfolio. portfolio. Um, and then we've got some sort of higher multiple PE stocks, still profitable. Um, just over twenty five percent, and then we've got some, um, yeah, some some not profitable companies which we we expect to be profitable and and you know or cash flow positive in in the uh, in the short term, short to medium term. Um, few few asset back plays and some cash, and and I suppose what I wanted to do was just highlight that you know. Um, it's less than 15% of the, of the companies are these uh, unprofitable companies and there's 10 names in there. So it's a really small um, uh, allocation to, to those companies just because they're, they're at the higher risk um, of, the, uh, of the spectrum. Um, so today I'm talking about uh, CCOS, which has just kind of moved into profitability and also Design Milk, which is, yeah, it's still not profitable. Um, and I've also just highlighted that, you know, if, if you buy a, a growing company on a reasonable multiple uh, and, um, you know, it, 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 it meets all its, you know, growth it, it targets, um, you know, it can turn into a, a high multiple company. And we've, we've seen that with one of our companies. I've used uh, Kit McGrath as the example. So I just wanted to, yeah, put the, the two companies mentioned in context of how we think about it. So we're looking for, Multi baggers in that in that sort of not profitable section, um, and and perhaps more uh, reliable um, sleep at night type stocks uh, in, in that larger but bar there. Yeah. Okay, great. And then maybe a bit more on uh, CCOS and, and their business, and uh, and you know what what uh, I guess what industry they operate in. Yeah, sure. So. Um, CCOS is, um, they, they do um, uh, traditional plastics and bioplastics. So, um, of course, the bioplastics is the interesting thing. Um, so, they, uh, they, the key products, uh, they've got uh, poop bags um, for dogs and um, sort of uh, another major line is uh, uh, compostable waste bags, which are um, really uh, popular. Um, uh, with the Australian Councils, they've, they've, they've uh, sort of won quite a few contracts there. Um, so it's your your household waste bags, um, and they're they're also um, yeah they're selling in uh, Woolworths now, and um, uh, yeah it's uh, yeah they, they've made quite a few strides uh, in the last yeah the, the last six months yeah, really, um, and yeah their their, their products or well, their bio biodegradable products are made from cornstarch. Okay. And is the, is the investment thesis, I guess, around the move away from their traditional plastics business um, more into the, the biodegradable plastics business uh, and that, that kind of shift in sales mix is that? Um, and obviously, the, I, I'm guessing the, the bioplastics is, a, you know, a, a much more a much faster growing market as people kind of convert from one to the other and they want to be one of the leaders in that yeah mark you've just stole my whole thesis uh <laughs> yeah so yeah you're right so i mean there's there's huge uh tailwinds in, in the bioplastics um both from a consumer choice perspective but also in many countries around the world those those single-use plastic bags are being banned um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's great tailwinds, um, but in, in CCOS's, uh, case, you know, they, um, yeah, their, their annual sales growth for the last quarter was up 178% in, in the bioplastics, uh, segment. So, you know, incredible growth, uh, coming through, um, and, and, you know, um, at the same time though, they, they had kind of sorted out their cost base and, uh, from being, um, you know, a growing cost base, they, they've trimmed it quite a bit and, and they're now quite lean. And um, yeah, as a result, you know, the, the, the uh, last week, uh, they announced that they were uh, 
uh, profitable. So it's quite a milestone for them. Um, and the, the other aspect of that is, you know, the, um, the, the margins on the, uh, the bioplastics are a lot higher than the traditional margins. Uh, so yeah, the, so having that sales growth and that, that margin growth combined, um, yeah, they've kind of turned, it, turned things around. Um, I suppose the other fat, uh, aspect is just um, the potential for uh, takeover. So if a traditional plastic um, manufacturer wanted to get into the space, they may well choose to acquire another company just to, to gain all the IP that um, CCLOS has. Um, I was going to uh, show a chart on the, just to highlight that uh, growth in, um, yeah. Yeah, control in sales. Um, hang on. Yeah, as I said, I've followed it for many, many years, and I think uh, Richard Taguni, the, the chairman, you know, he's had, a, he's had a lot of hard work to do, as you say, on that cost base in terms of, you know, they've moved some manufacturing overseas, from what I remember, uh, closed, uh, you know, kind of unprofitable production sites or consolidated in Mohina, Australia to kind of just have a, you know, a more regional approach. And, you know, lot, I guess batting lots of singles, if I, if I can use like a, a cricket term instead of, you know, trying to like knock one straight out of the park, you know, he's been, you know, building up a, a good innings but you know it's a lot it's a lot of singles over 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 kind of a, a long stretch of innings but I think uh, you know now now you're starting to see the fruits of all of that all of that hard work over the last two or three years by from Richard and the team yeah that's right um yeah it's been a long it's been a long road um yeah so what I was going to highlight on this this slide was just that the gray bars are the the traditional plastics and you can see it's gone from three million close to 2 million. And the other colors are all the bio uh, plastics. It's gone, yeah. yeah From yeah. about 2 million up to, you know, what is it, uh, nearly six. And so that the percentage of sales of the bioplastics have gone from 38 to 73. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been an amazing progress. Um, and and just on, on your, uh, Comment, it's been a long road. This is the share price for the last 10 years. It's just, I mean, it's been awful for shareholders. They keep on raising and, and you know, I think a lot of startups, it just takes a long time for things to, um, to come right. And in the case of um, Seacoast, they, they probably were too far, you know, they were ahead of the game as far as the, the uh, consumer preferences and the regulatory aspects it's not they've kind of caught up to, to sea costs i think um but yeah we, we we bought um in uh yeah in, in june they had a great uh march quarter they were approaching break even and yeah we thought um we yeah you know, we're pretty happy to get in then there's lots of tax loss selling for those disgruntled uh shareholders um yeah so it was a yeah great setup and the kind of kind of company that we you know we look for, yeah. And in terms of risks around Seacos, I mean, I think uh, you know they're as you said they're, they're just turning profitable now, so maybe they're they're kind of past that risk. But in terms of you know you say you, they're they're open to an acquisition from a more established player. So, but but is there also the flip side of that the risk that a Vizi or a Pact or somebody like that you know makes an investment for them that's you know maybe not that large but it, it, it's enough to you know really disrupt the, the growth in sea costs is that one of the main risks you see going forward for them or what are some of the risks yeah yeah i think so so um you, actually in europe the the competition's a lot uh more intense um and sort of asia pacific's been a bit uh left open a bit um so yeah, the risk is that um, you know that, that those European companies start taking some some margin, bring the margins down. I think um, yeah, it's certainly a risk to be uh, watching closely. Um, okay. They've also got a bit of uh, customer concentration risk with uh, a large US distributor over there as well. So yeah, they're certainly not out of the woods yet. Okay, and in terms of I guess 
you know, they're going to, I know they're still Appendix 4C reporting, if I remember correctly, but the, the February result will be coming up and then the, the March Appendix 4C in April. You, are, you know, what are some of the key things to watch out for in, in those results in terms of commentary about where the business or are, are, are financials that you're looking for? You know, what, what should people be watching out for, let's say, over the next kind of the three to four months, giving their, you know, going to be, sending out a lot of uh you know official announcements yeah look um we don't know what the the uh the half year result will be so it'll be interesting to see you know what's the magnitude of that profit um but yeah i, I suppose i'm keen to just see how those gross margins are, are tracking um and also um yeah the most exciting thing will be new new contracts so if they can um when a courier bag contract, uh, you can you can imagine, you know, there's a huge opportunity, and you know, I think I think they've got that that product. They just need to find the the client. Um, so it's yeah, that uh, new contracts, and then just I, I guess that that just that sales momentum that, that it continues. Perfect, and then. Uh... Yeah, one I'm very interested to hear about if we move on to the second one, because there's not one I know much about. Um, Design Milk. Uh, I had a quick look before we started. It's certainly had a lot of uh, change in the last six months. They've done share consolidations, name changes, ticker changes, uh, raised a bit of capital. So I think, yeah, let's maybe again get back to first principles and, and um, you know, how do these guys make their money? Yeah. Yeah, so they um, so they've got uh, three three websites. the The key website is uh, Design Milk. Um, it's 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 a blog and it's a marketplace. So they they sell products um, on there. So it generates revenue from advertising, which is about twenty percent, and then and the rest from uh, e commerce. So it's um, yeah they. they they're not they, they don't do the logistics they just like take a commission uh for the sale and the the vendor does all the logistics so they've got you know a really capital light business they've got a you know some websites some uh some some writers for blogs um and uh you know uh not shopify yeah shopify uh back end uh less than 10 people based in the us so it's a, it's a really small small business but um yeah, so it's a yeah. u.s business but listed on the asx uh well it's or not a, yeah it's business? it's a headquarters are, are in australia uh it's got an australian board really yeah. um the yeah but it's got a bit of bit of history uh so it's um listed as aha life in 2015 and and it really highlights how hard uh, e-commerce is. Um, so, you know, they um, they couldn't make any money, right? So they, they were selling these designer goods online, trying to high-end design stuff, um, but the cost of acquisition, so um, getting customers onto the site, um, you know, it was, it was just making, making a, an unprofitable um, Proposition, and in fact, I was looking at a, a company uh, earlier today. What's it called? Um, CTT uh, Setire, and you know, they've got the exactly the same problem. That they make a a gross margin of they're looking at twenty four million, and then they spent seven million on fulfillment, and then eleven million on advertising and marketing. So. They're basically loss making even after you know 70 million of sales revenue. And you know, that's exactly the same problem, but probably worse that than um that design milk had or the, the previous incarnation, which was Aha Life. So in 2019, they bought this blog called Design Milk. Um, and at the time its only revenue came from uh, advertising. And so the um yeah, the idea was to uh, monetize those um, that that blog. So they bought the blog with uh, seven million uh, sort of social media followers, um, and yeah, it, 
I think there's there was two million on on Instagram, and I think it's now three million. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 idea of sort of slowly but surely just introducing e-commerce to, to to those users and and doing it without having to spend a lot of money on Facebook, you know, Google AdWords. Um, that that's really the the key thing here. So it's trying to monitor. I'd say one more thing about um, you know that. That whole dynamic of spending money on um, advertising for e-commerce is unlike bricks and mortar, you know, where you've got your, your fixed rent. You don't know how much you're going to have to pay for your, your Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. They go up all the time. They've, they've just gone up quite a lot recently. And so it's a really tough business if you're just winning, um, uh, acquiring customers, you know, without some sort of following. Um, mm -hmm. So it's trying to monetize that captive audience from from the blog, um, while still, you know, it, it maybe washing its face with the advertising revenue, um, and w early signs that they're starting to achieve that, or or I guess you know what attracted you to the to the story was it was it the fact that they had this large audience that they could potentially monetize at a much lower cost than trying to get call customers i guess yeah exactly so um yeah just that that low uh customer acquisition cost um with the, with the, we thought nine million followers was pretty impressive um the other thing is you know they're sort of net advertising positive so they actually instead of paying for advertising they they put up ads on their their site and, and they make two million from it which you know is remarkable for e-commerce site um they're they're increasing their vendors so they, they had 25 vendors when they started we got 450 now and they're planning to have 900 by the end of uh calendar year 21 um uh what else uh yeah it's a very low cost capex business and and they're almost cash flow break even so it kind of ticks that that box for us that they're nearly there to move into profitability okay and the and the key the key risks I guess uh, I mean is it just like everything in in microcaps it just takes longer than uh, than the, than they initially planned. Yeah, look, I, I'm not sure the business model's completely proven out yet. I mean, they haven't gone into profitability. They were nearly profitable, but that was also you know the best quarter, uh, you know the Christmas quarter. Um, so it's. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I'd, I'd say it, it's risky in that in that sense. Um, and, probably, and the other the other big I was gonna say the other big had risk had is they might um, COVID. Sorry, I'd say they probably also had a decent tailwind from COVID. You know, in the last six to twelve oh, yeah, months. Yeah, yeah, it's like all the retailers. It's really difficult at the moment to to work out what's uh, sustainable. Um, exactly. Um, I, the, the other big risk, I think, is um, they might alienate their, their blog readership by uh, pushing too much e-commerce on them. Um, there's, yeah, I've got quite a few risks. Uh, so there's key man and, and key woman risk. The CEO, you know, is, is pretty key to the, the um, running and mm. execution. The chief creative officer, she is the original owner of uh, Design Milk and, and looks after all the creative content. So... Yeah, probably her leaving would be, you know, uh, that she, she might take some followers with her. Um, yeah. And then announcements for this business. I mean, are, are you? Is it as simple as adding vendors, uh, growing the growing the top line, and moving the cash flow break even over the next, let's say, six months? Is that kind of the, the three big things to watch for? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's the they, they actually publish their conversion rates. So uh, the number of uh, 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 purchases from a, from a entering the site and, and they're, they're kind of well below uh, the, um, the market averages. Um, and if they can bring that up, um, because it is quite a capital light business, um, uh, yeah, that we'd, we'd expect quite a lot of the uh, revenues to drop to the bottom line. Um, the other thing is um, our acquisition. So um, they've basically stated that, you know, they've got three sites now and they've got a platform to roll out other sites so they could acquire another 
maybe another blog type site and, and, and sort of rinse and repeat. Okay. Okay. So watch out for acquisitions as well. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chris. It definitely sounds like a, a, an interesting story. And I think one that's, um, you know, definitely off the, the market trader. I think market cap's around 10 or 11 million. Is that, is that right? Yeah. 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 It's, okay. it's, it's, yeah, it's right in our ballpark, you know, small, unknown and, and quite unloved as well. It, yeah. The sheer chat, the sheer price charts just as bad as the, the, the C-cost. The C-cost one would just overlay DMC instead of SES. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chris, we're going we're gonna to have to leave it there. Listen, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I know you gave us the website uh, at the start. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch with you directly, um, just uh, contact at DMX or Chris at DMX or what's the best way to get uh, uh, You can either do team at DMX. Okay. am.com.au or chris.stepto at dmxam.com.au um, yeah our website's uh, dmxam.com.au and um, we um, yeah we do we do a monthly newsletter we, we tend to give way too much away on it uh, so you can sign up there for that and you can also uh, register for the new fund uh, on that site as well okay brilliant Chris, we're going to leave you there. Thanks very much for your time today. And uh, yeah, I'll keep an eye out with interest uh, on the launch of the new fund when it comes uh, next month. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Chris.